Hi everyone, your Chess Puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. This is it, guys. It's the biannual World Chess Championship that was postponed from last year for obvious reasons that we should not be going into. We have just about a few minutes extra to explain a few things, so no better time than the present to try and discuss what to expect at least. As you may already know, the game starts today and will finish on the 16th of December. If we have a player who reaches 7.5 points, then that player wins a championship. There are games, 14 of them, that will be played every day, with the exception of the 29th of November the 2nd of December, and there is another day off on December the 9th, and there is December the 13th, which will also be given off for the players to rest. And should we have a tie break, do we expect these to take place on the 15th of December? The prize fund for this event a whopping 2 million euro. 60% of that goes to the winner. In case you're looking at how much exactly it is taking home, the winner will be taking home 1.2 million euro. And the other would take home 800k. That is plenty of money compared to previous events. If the games go to a tiebreak, there will be a 55-45 split. Time controls are 120 plus 60 plus 15. The only thing is helpful is this. Players cannot agree to draw before they reach 30 moves. And listen to this. A draw is possible when there is a three-fold repetition, just in case you wonder. Now, I know it's a bit late, Better late than never. This is where the games are played. It's absolutely breathtaking to be here. This is not the best picture I have to show, but check out this one. And if this picture is a bit dark, what do you make of this one? Dubai is just magic. Let us hope the games will also be magical. Right a few minutes before Magnus and the challenger Napa get off the ground, but let's just hope there's also something else to what we saw last time. And by this I mean the openings and game structures we saw in the last World Chess Championship. I guess the first few games will be slow and slightly dull, but I hope I'm so, so wrong. Now let's introduce this board for today. Let us add all the necessary details and let's get ready to shoot when the game of round one gets underway. So this is round one of the World Chess Championship of 2021, which was meant to have taken place last year. And here we go, guys, we have a kickoff. Just before we get to see what is going on, I left a gap about Magnus's name and Nepos's name. The pictures I have to <laughs> do not appear. Let's get these up and running and let's continue. So. Here they are, and this is the game. Okie dokie, we have an E4 opening. There comes E5, and this has to go into either the Spanish or Italian. Knight F3, Knight C6, there comes the Spanish. Magnus chases after the bishop. We have a retreat, and with Knight F6, Nepal here, castles. We've seen this opening thousands of times. Magnus cannot for either the open or closed Spanish. Okay, he goes for the closed. Nepo lines up the rook here. Magnus goes for the usual attack on the bishop. We have a second retreat. What Magnus chose to do here was to castle. All sorts of moves here by Nepo. He does in fact opt for a very interesting move. 
it's this opening on the king's side. It stops the access of g4. For now, it's all preparation, and both have very much prepared for every single move up to this point at least. Bishop b7 is coming. Magnus here will try and take advantage of this bishop sitting on b3. If Magnus wants him, you can easily go after him. If you do, you will drop this central pawn on e5. There is nothing new in this position. This might explain why the move's coming very fast. And yes, Magnus has sat on this move for just about 2 minutes and 38 seconds. He does chase after the bishop. At the same time, he's willing to drop a pawn, a central pawn, if you like. With the bishop clearly coming off, Nepal does go on to remove this central pawn. There comes the bishop off to the knight, with Magnus getting the bishop into the diagonal. Magnus is slowly, slowly adding or trying to add the pressure on this guy when he falls. So Magnus is down by full pawn, but he aims to get something back in terms of compensation. You can cover in three different ways here. Knight c3 is much expected, but in the end, this is how Nepal covers. There is no doubt this game is now taking some shape. Inevitably, Magnus will put the central pawn under some pressure. d5 is expected, and no doubt this is exactly how Magnus plays it. Knight c3 is still very playable, but Nepal does go on to remove this guy, and with Magnus here taking with this queen. Is he really threatening a mating one? He is, but there are so many ways to block it. Knight f3 is very playable. After a very hypothetical rook e8, and something like bishop f4, if you now attack this bishop, back him off, introduce now the knight into the picture, and this game is on. Knight c3 works very well. But this will be quite a deep combo to look at. Okay, we have something different. So let's come back to this position. Nepal went for a move, actually a very drastic move, or a very drastic line. He challenged the queen. And obviously he's hoping Magnus will trade. If you do, if you're going to eliminate the knight, this is what you need. Magnus will be in trouble. Rookie eight, take and take, and you tell me how Nepal will need to play it. It has to be this bishop move to d2. Once you back off the bishop to safety, after the knight comes out, Magnus will need a miracle to survive. Okay, let's come back. Magnus devised actually something else. He added the pressure on this knight. And believe you me, this is how Nepal plays it. This move is key. Shall we see why? Let's see what a potential attack on the queen really does as an alternative. You know, just take the knight with the queen, take the queen, grab the queen on f3, and if you now chase after this bishop, once he backs off to safety, this will be a done deal. So knight c3 to chase after the queen will in fact be the end of this game. So right after king f1, to have the rook on e1 protected, don't get me wrong, you can still opt for the trade we just saw. But with Magnus knowing exactly the ins and outs of this variation, this is the move he opted for. So with the bishop on the diagonal now covered, Nepal trades off the queens, with Magnus capturing using the knights. What happened next? This is how Nepal answers. We're clearly out of any preparation because of the game slowing down, actually. When the queens were traded, well, actually, when the, when the queen was traded on d5, Nepal spent 8 minutes and 12 seconds. This bishop moved to d2, which appears to be spot on, and also bent 5 minutes and 11 seconds of Nepal's clock. With everything going on, at least this game is a joy to follow. We have moved away from 
any very famous lines. And at least we were not going to see any repetitions of the last World Championship. So let's not jinx it, shall we? With Magnus having everything covered, he blasted along with this guy. Neville backs off the knight, not to get him potentially pinned. With Magnus now spending a record 21 minutes and 25 seconds, he finally chooses to activate this rook on the last. Knight c3 challenging the knight. Magnus here finds a perfect opportunity to come in with this threat. And because there are not one but two moves to block or cover for this attack, it had to be a move using either rock. Therefore, use this rock. Magnus here introduces the last rock into the game and it tries to make him more useful. Does knight a2 work here to get the knight on b4 moving? It does, and Nepal does go for a knight move, but this is where he puts him. With the knight now b4 having no real incredible threats, Magnus backs him off, and I may be surprised here why he did not land Nepal with a double pawn on f3. He may still, though, if he gets another chance. Nepal is looking to take advantage of this position. He realigned this bishop here. Are we Magnus backing off his knights further afield? Nepal here uses the knight to charge after the bishop. And remember a point we just made with the story of the double pawn on f3. Magnus trades here, and with two minor pieces coming off next, has Magnus got what he wanted? He's still down by full pawn. But his position looks very good, in fact. Rook c6, just in time to block or cover for this guy in a6, let now to this attack. So with the knight now jumping here, this is going to be an extremely interesting endgame. c3 stopping the access to d4, and this game, believe me, is on. It's going to be a close run, and this is how we'd like to see things progress. Okay, knight d4 is no longer possible. But why can Magnus go knight h4 to get to this pawn on f3? And this is exactly how he plays it. Rook e3 is forced and played. Magnus here activates his king and therefore challenges the knight. With Magnus avoiding any trade, this is where he puts this knight. Nepal went after this knight once again but this time uses a more powerful tool. G6 stopping the attack, and there appears to be gaps everywhere. His guy in D3 needs to be covered if you want to save him. There are three ways to cover. In fact, there are four ways. One is rook A D1, two is knight F4, and three, there is knight E1. Okay, if you're looking for that fourth move, this will be to go for a king move. It looks risky, but with a rook on e5, this will be a possibility. Okay, never played this one relatively fast. You got the knight to back off. Magnus too backs off his own knight. And of course, Magnus wants this knight to come into e6. Never takes here just over nine minutes to launch his next response. He pulls the rook back to e4. What Magnus does here is to charge after this rook. Rook back to the third, got the knight to find the sixth. Believe it or not, Magnus is now playing for a win. How do you stop knight f4? And how do you save this guy on h3? Maybe you don't have to. Nepal can stop the knight's access to f4 and there is only one way to do this. He went for it all right. Now, to save the pawn and get yourself potentially in trouble does not sound very rosy. Magnus is an extremely experienced player, very resourceful. What he came up with was a top-notch move. This was our move. Given Magnus has the ability to play instantly, 
He gave this move three minutes and 23 seconds and passes now the buck onto Nepo. H4 looks like the right move to stop the knight from moving into G5. Rook AC1 may also be something, but Nepo can't afford to take the wrong turn. Okay, after 12 minutes and nearly 10 seconds, Nepo brings his king to the second. And Magnus now brings back the rook to the queen side. And with Nepo once again marching with his majesty, Magnus takes with a check. And much depends on how you capture. If you do this with a king, after you allow this knight in, you will get busted. Go rook a3 to save the pawn, and this will be the end. After this fork appears, it's all over. You don't even need that fat lady to sing. So not to allow this knight to invade into a d4, this is how Magnus, or I beg your pardon, this is how Nepal captures. And with Magnus now taking, Nepal goes after this rook. Rook back to the seventh. And this is a tough one. Do you remember h4? Well, this is what Nepal does. King f7, Nepal brings the rook back to the first. There goes the king again, and this time to the sixth. And this one now is a tricky one. Do you add the pressure on a6? Do you challenge the rook on b7, or is this something else? Something like 93. Is that something? Well, we are going to find out because this is what Nepal does. He centralized the knight. Magnus here tries rook d7 and actually with some delay to make sure no tricks are in the making. This is how Nepal plays it. He's looking at a possible fork but Magnus spots it instantly. Rook e7. Nepal now chases after one rook, rook d6. There comes the knight back to attack the rook. And I feel this is going to be it. And in fact, it was. With a repetition going on this game now, and it's in a dead draw. And this, I think, is an outcome no one really wanted. And to be fair, it is a fair result. Nepal had some advantage, some initiative, if you like. But Magnus found a way to equalize. And of course, this game ends in no drama. Far more to follow, hopefully, and very soon. So you're a chess puzzler here, and you know the drill. Safety always first.